Come explore the worlds of National Geographic video. This program is made possible by a grant from the people of Chevron. We're proud to bring new worlds to your world. need or curiosity, man has learned much about the earth on which he is both guest and prisoner. Often baffled in his brief journey through time, he has found reassurance in the order revealed in nature, the recurring sequence of the seasons, the symmetry in storm. Yet nothing has lessened his terror when nature seems to turn against him, when the earth shudders and explodes in fire making rubble of all he has built. Twenty thousand people dead, anywhere from fifty thousand to a hundred and fifty thousand injured. Hey, if, if that's it, there's there's a CCP there, the communication ought to go back. Is that damn ready to go? Against the sudden blows of an adversary that often strikes without warning, some have tried to create defenses. Powerless to prevent eruption or earthquake, they seek to diminish its toll. Others light candles of faith, seek safety in prayer. Today, new candles light the dark. Instruments whose beams are reflected from distant objects or catch radio signals from outer space to measure the smallest movements of the Earth's surface. Now man has devised new concepts of the forces altering our planet. Forces that move the continents, twist the globe's thin crust, build vast mountain ranges even beneath the sea. Like all living things, Earth is in ceaseless change. Born of fire, it too is being transformed day by day. Once this was blank ocean, the cold storm-swept Atlantic off the southern coast of Iceland. Then, in fiery eruption during the winter of 1963, the island of Circe began to emerge from the sea. Today, its single square mile of ash and lava forms one of the newer additions to the land surface of the globe. Yet, this virgin terrain is no longer wasteland. Already life has found it. Already seeds born by wind and wave have taken root in the ash, and birds have begun to nest along the cliffs. A closed preserve to casual visitors, the island has become a living laboratory. Here, scientists from distant countries can study the ways by which life tests and gradually seizes a new domain, 
Among them is Dr. Robert Ballard, geologist from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution on Cape Cod. The story I often tell to try to get across the point that the Earth really is alive. If you were to interview a butterfly standing on the branch of a sequoia tree. Now, a butterfly lives for only a few days, and a sequoia tree can live for over a thousand years. And you were to ask that butterfly, do you perceive the object on which you're standing as, as being alive? And the butterfly would say, of course not. I've been here all my life, five days, and the tree hasn't done a thing. Same problem with the human being. If you were to ask a human being, perhaps one that's lived a hundred years, if they perceive the Earth, which is over four and a half billion years in age, as being alive, they'd probably say, of course not. I've been here all my life and it hasn't done a thing. But the Earth really is a very dynamic object. In fact, I think of it as a living organism. Like Circe, Earth too is an island not in the North Atlantic, but in the vaster sea of space. In time beyond the measure of man's brief experience, it too is in slow and ceaseless change. Some 200 million years ago, its land masses formed a single continent scientists call Pangaea. Then slowly, Pangaea's fracturing plates began to move apart like pieces of a vast jigsaw puzzle gradually assuming the shapes and arrangement we recognize on maps today. Riding upon a semi-plastic layer of Earth's fiery interior, the ocean floors and continents that form its crust, or lithosphere, are in continuing motion. Though the continents seem stationary to living populations, they move an inch or more each year. The friction occurring along the plate margins is often marked by earthquakes and volcanic eruption. Sometimes, as in California's San Andreas Fault, the opposing plates grind against each other in a sideways or lateral motion called translation. It is when a section of the fault locks, builds up tension, then abruptly releases that major earthquakes occur. In other areas, such as Japan, in a movement known as subduction, the edge of one crustal plate slowly slides beneath another, causing volcanic activity and tremors. Along the 46,000 mile mid-ocean ridge, in an action called spreading, molten rock or magma emerges through fissures in the ocean floor soon congealing in new submerged crust. Sometimes, as in Iceland and its offshore islands of Circe and Hemai, the action has created new land above the sea. Barely 200 miles south of the Arctic Circle on the fiery seam, still building Iceland itself, Hemahe is accustomed to change. Port for the fleet that fishes the abundant waters nearby, its only town of Vestmanair has seen many a storm take its toll of men and ships. Hardy descendants of the Vikings who colonized the island more than a thousand years ago, its people long have learned to live with uncertainty, to meet risk and hazard with a cheerful face. Each summer, by long-standing tradition, the entire population moves out of town on a three-day community holiday. It is a gathering that harks back to Viking times, when villagers assembled to review the spoken laws by which they lived. On the grassy floor of an ancient volcanic crater, they build a tent city where the people of the town rediscover each other in a quite different setting.
Side by side, they celebrate many things. Home rule won from Denmark more than a century ago. The inheritance of their Viking past. Their survival of dangers that sometimes rise from the earth itself. At midnight, young men set fire to a great wooden structure built on the hillside. As the flames flare against the dark, they summon varied emotions among the watchers. To their Nordic forefathers, fire brought warmth in the numbing cold. It was a symbol of life, of rebirth. But the people of Hemae have long known that it also can bring destruction and death. In the winter darkness of January 1973, it brought disaster. Just beyond the town's edge, a fissure cracked the earth, abruptly spewing molten lava and ash hundreds of feet into the air. Roused from their beds by the sudden threat, most of the population was evacuated to the nearby mainland. But volunteers would fight a five-month battle with the new volcano, now called Elfell, Fire Mountain. Within a week, Elfell had raised a black smoldering cone 600 feet high and covered the town in ash. More than a hundred buildings had been burned or crushed under the advancing wall of lava. In early February, the lava threatened to block the entrance to the harbor. Desperately, emergency teams fought to dam the flow by hardening the lava with great streams of cold seawater. last, by heroic effort, the harbor was saved. But as the eruption continued through ensuing months, the lava would add almost one square mile to the island, while much of the town lay buried under cinders and ash. It would take years to dig out, but at last the precincts of the dead are tidy again. Under the lava wall, children play, most with little knowledge or memory of what happened here. They have other things to do. Elsewhere in Iceland, life goes on. Under the shadows of the volcanoes that remain a perpetual enigma, farmers gather crops, prepare for the winter to come. They are doing more. Boldly, Icelanders are making use of the very forces that threaten them. In the north of the mainland, near the Kropla volcano, they are attempting to harness the heat of a great geothermal field to power homes and industrial installations. Recent eruptions have reminded Icelanders of the unpredictability of the powers they are trying to employ. With Dr. Haralda Sigurdsson, volcanologist from the University of Rhode Island, Dr. Ballard visits a site where recent lava flow has threatened a newly built electric power plant. It's the power plant below us here. And if you look over this way, you see yeah, the you can see the recent flows. Entire caldera, recent lavas. Now the flows that were what earlier this year are down there. Yes, then you can see the steam defining the fissure that's been erupting during the last five years, and the black lava flows that have been coming out. So if uh, let's say there were another eruption right along the caldera where we see the fissures opening up, the lava could just come down this valley and go right around the corner to the power plant. Icelanders invested in the costly geothermal power plant because the field had lain dormant for over 200 years. 
Begun in 1975 as an alternative to a hydroelectric dam, the plant was almost immediately threatened by a series of violent eruptions that brought the lava flow within a mile and a half. Trying to discern a possible pattern in the crop of volcanic activity, scientists keep watch on the plant and the surrounding area for ominous signs. Here, one of the monitoring team checks for any ground tilt, which could unbalance and destroy the turbines. In a field near the plant, he checks daily for signs of subterranean activity, measures any possible change in the gap between two pipes planted on opposite sides of a fissure. Like a serpent's back rising above the sea, the steaming crest of the mid-ocean ridge stretches across Iceland. Here, Ballard and Sigurdsson visit the site of the recent lava flow that is still cooling. Come onto the lava. We are in the fissure that erupted uh, six months ago. So everything we're walking on is less than six months in age. That's right, and it's still cooling off here. That's why it's still like a sauna bath. It's about as fresh as you can get, short of having it red. Yes, sit Take and this look in. around here. If you can sit without cutting your pants. Oh, that's even warm. I understand that when uh, this eruption began to take place, a, a tourist from Denmark or something was standing right where the fissure opened up. And it was quite close to the uh, uh, area where the uh, crust split and rifted apart, and the lava started to squirt up. So he just took off. And actually, I understand that the lava was moving quite rapidly here. Uh, up how to how 10, fast? Up to 10 meters per second. They so you'd have to be up. a... That's, let's see, that's uh, the world's record for the 100-yard dash is... Uh, 9.8. So it's it's running about as fast as the world's record. So hope the Dane was a fast runner. He was, he got away. So far, there have been no casualties. Before this took place, this area had been quiet for a long, long time. This is why they thought it was safe to build the power plant. This area has been uh, without volcanic activity for about 250 years, and... Uh, Therefore, uh, there was the general feeling that uh, there wasn't an imminent danger and it was a worthwhile risk to take to uh, start construction of a geothermal power station in this uh, central volcano. And uh, they've invested what? Oh, probably about $60 million. So $60 the... million dollars is really in peril then if, if another major eruption occurs here and this time it does go over that pass and down into the basin. Well, that's always a possibility, but in Iceland, there's a, uh, Iceland is a country where you have to live with the elements. In patient calm, Icelanders accept the gamble nature has imposed upon them. The frigid climate, the sweeping storms, the hidden threat beneath their feet. Even as they keep a wary eye on the dangerous giant who has built the very island on which they live, they use his heat to warm their cities and homes, even their indoor gardens, a kind of compensation for the risks they philosophically endure. In winter darkness, they take light from the subterranean depths. Warmed by the hidden furnace of the earth itself, vegetables ripen in the Arctic cold. In the volcano's fiery breath, flowers bloom. Yet the risk remains. Hardly a year after eruptions threatened a power installation, 
Sigurdsson returned to Krapla as the restless giant stirred and became active. Once more, the lava flow approached within one and a half miles of the electric turbine. Though the fiery fountains gradually subsided, the eruption raised the ground level to provide a slope for future lava flows to travel toward the power plant. For the present, the Kropla installation is secure. But Icelanders know that eventually they may have to pay the price of living on the edge of creation. Sometimes the action of the mid-ocean ridge brings surprisingly opposite effects. In Iceland, its slow spreading process over millions of years has created the great island on which the people live. Far southeastward, along the nearly 3,000 mile furrow of Africa's Great Rift Valley, the spreading action is slowly but inexorably opening the heart of a continent. In measurable time to come, Eastern Africa will be detached from its mother continent and this dusty desert landscape will be an ocean floor. Already in the Afar Triangle at the Horn of Africa, the process has begun. The sea is invading the land. At Djibouti's Rubat al-Harab, an inland extension of the Gulf of Aden, the sea is temporarily delayed by a narrow barrier of small volcanic hills sealing off Lake Asal. But as magma seeps through fissures in the Earth's crust and the seven-mile rift widens and sinks, the sea inevitably will pour into the lowlands beyond. Already, seawater from Rubat al-Harab has begun to work its way downward through cracks and subterranean channels, undergoing substantial chemical change as it penetrates the heated rock layers below. With Dr. Jean-Louis Cheminet of the French National Center for Scientific Research, Ballard descends into a recently active fissure through which a small flow of seawater reaches the distant lake. So this is uh, the sea coming in, right? Yeah, by, by a system of fissure. Yeah. But this is where the water that we see on the other side of the rift going yeah. into Lake Assel originates from? Yes. So it comes from in the from the, the sea. Yeah. From the sea and across uh, uh, the rift by uh, the fissure of the gar inside the mountain and uh, out the other out side. The, yeah. Now, was this fissure in existence in 1978? Yes, yes. It, 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 just, it just widened? Just, and, just widened. Because just a lot of these rocks widened. look yeah. just perched as if they're ready to come down. <clears throat> now. Yes, and the car here, just right. near. Right. <laughs> well, we should move the car. Like this. So we'll go across the. Uh, Not the cross exactly okay, like we this. Go, no. We go across this area, yeah. though, right? Now, how how long will it take us to get to south? To we get went to from south. we went from here all the way across. Went across that flat desert-like area. How long yes. will it take to get there? <clears throat> Maybe six hours. Six hours. Six hours. Yeah. Maybe more. Six hours. Six six and a half.
In torrid heat that reaches more than 130 degrees Fahrenheit, the water here and in the Rift Valley is often reduced to a caustic brine. I'm standing 500 feet below sea level near the shore at Lake Asal. The ocean is only six miles away. If it weren't for these young lava flows filling the valley floor, I'd be underwater right now. In fact, the ocean's trying to do that. As rifting develops in the valley, these deep fissures start to form. This lets water travel beneath the valley through the fissures and it can enter Lake Asal along this outlet. In fact, there's several of them in the valley. At the present moment, it's so hot that most of the seawater that comes in evaporates, leaving the salt behind. But as rifting continues, more and more water will pour through these fissure systems until the sea claims this entire area as the ocean penetrates deeper and deeper into the continent of Africa. Here, as in Iceland, the spreading action creates new crust. Elsewhere, in compensation, the distant edges of an expanding plate must be destroyed. Outpost of Asia, Japan's island chain bears the shock of the Philippine and Pacific plates as they thrust beneath the Eurasian plate in a massive subduction zone. In the deep ocean trenches off Japan, the aging plates plunge back into Earth's molten interior, causing powerful disturbances. The mists here are dragon's breath, the hissing steam of Japan's 20,000 hot springs and 40 active volcanoes. With a long history of destructive earthquakes, Japan has begun a massive effort to prepare for the future. In Shizuoka's prefecture near Tokyo, school children take lessons in reading, writing, and catastrophe, learning the skills that may save their lives. In this temple to the victims of a great disaster, memory and reality are like the mismatched faces of an earthquake fault. Here, survivors come to witness again the day a world ended. Search again for faces that exist only in old men's dreams. Just before noon on Saturday, September 1st, 1923, an earthquake registering 7.9 on the Richter scale struck Tokyo, shaking the earth for a full five minutes. Ignited by hot coals thrown from stoves against paper walls and straw matting, the city burst into flame. As the people fled into the streets, they converged on the river. From opposite banks, refugees started across the wooden bridges only to meet head-on in mid-span. Surrounded by walls of fire with no escape, the fleeing mass was locked in panic and chaos. Next day, two-thirds of Tokyo lay in smoldering black ash and more than 140,000 persons were dead. Today, the Japanese are building more than temples to the dead. Fearful of a predicted recurrence of the great Kanto quake, 13 million persons in the Tokyo and nearby Tokai areas participate in a vast drill in which every citizen is learning to play a role. Public communication center during a crisis, NHK television relays information from the Japan Meteorological Agency, or JMA. Here, a vast warning system keeps constant watch through scores of seismic stations and a 125-mile line of seismic monitors along the floor of Suruga Bay, probable epicenter of the expected quake. At the first sign of unusual activity, JMA instantly alerts the head of a six-man committee of seismologists. Known as the Hantekai, this team quickly evaluates the information and the prime minister is notified. 
while police, firemen, and other public employees take their posts to prevent general confusion or panic, there is a delay of 30 minutes before a warning is broadcast. Each of the Tokai region's cities and towns has a municipal disaster plan, and through drills, most people have learned the precise steps required after such a warning. Turning off gas and electricity, citizens secure doors and cabinets, then take up their earthquake kits and march off to join the general exodus through predetermined escape routes. In the street, a rope helps maintain unity and order, wards off panic by providing a sense of common security within a group. Guided and patrolled by emergency forces, a swelling flood of people from home and factory moves toward assigned refuge areas. To escape the giant sea wave or tsunami which often follows a quake, the harbor fleet sets out to sea. The drill has been a costly effort, but the price seems small compared to the threatened loss of life in one of the most heavily populated areas on Earth. Eastward across the sea, this tree-shaded oasis near California's Mojave Desert offers deceptive sanctuary. Like Japan's thermal cauldrons, it too is part of the ring of fire that circles the Pacific. Here along the 700-mile San Andreas Fault, the Pacific Plate grinds slowly northward against the North American Plate, sometimes locking, building stress, then suddenly releasing in earthquake. Whether exposed as a naked scar crossing the Carrizo Plain near Los Angeles, or pleasantly disguised under grassy slopes and a chain of sag ponds near San Francisco, the fault stretches like a taut line of danger between the state's two most heavily populated centers. In times past, each of the cities has felt its power. Once the fabled gateway to the gold rush, its hills crowned with ornate palaces of mining and railroad tycoons, San Francisco today soars in a dazzling array of skyscrapers along its Embarcadero, daring evidence of a city that refused to die. Dr. Ballard recalls a fateful morning at the beginning of the century. On the 18th of April, 1906, the San Andreas Fault suddenly snapped. The city of San Francisco felt the brunt of the blow. Some 700 people were killed and most of the city was destroyed by fire. Today, people think of it as an event found in history books. Yet to geologists, the fault is very much alive. We are monitoring the fault system, attempting to understand its behavior and predict its next move. One thing we do know, we will experience another earthquake like that of 1906. It's just a matter of time. This map shows the, the major faults in the Bay Area, and the one that we're most concerned about here is the San Andreas Fault that's running up the peninsula. The map is fairly detailed, and we could probably find your street here. This is South of the city, University below the sag ponds that mark the fault, Residents, such as the family of James and Susan Morris, begin to prepare for the predicted quake. They're located in what's classified as very strong earthquake intensity. Hmm? It's, <laughs> it's, it, it, really? Yeah, it's, it's classified as very strong. The reason being is your proximity to the fault line. You're fairly close to the San Andreas Fault. You're about four miles from it. Let's take a look at the sill here. You can see that the sill is running around foundation of the home. Mm -hmm. What we're checking for here is to make sure we have anchor bolts running through the, that sill there into the foundation. Okay. How can you tell? 
Well, you'll see a bolt, oh. and it will be right on top of the of the sill itself. And there aren't any. And there aren't any bolts. Okay. Well, the valve that you want to turn off is this coming right out of the ground directly. It's uh -huh. the first valve we come to. Now let's just pretend that an earthquake happens, okay? It's late at night, mom's put you to bed, and then all of a sudden an earthquake happens and things start to shake in the room. What are you going to do real quick? Really quick. Very good. That's great. We haven't always lived in California. And frankly, the more I heard about earthquakes, the more terrified I got. And it occurred to me that we had no idea what to do if one occurred. We didn't know whether the house was safe. So that's why we called Dave Hedman to bring him in and have him look at the house. But it's clear from, from his inspection and from just thinking about it a little bit that we are not able, as a family even, to do everything that's going to be involved if a major earthquake uh, occurs. And that's one of the reasons that we're calling this meeting today, because regardless of how independent you like to think of yourself as being, you are you going to be dependent on your neighbor. For this particular neighborhood is trying to find out what resources we have together that might be helpful in the event of a disaster. At dawn, February 9th, 1971, an earthquake registering 6.4 on the Richter scale struck the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles. Twisting railroad tracks, shattering highway overpasses, it strewed disaster across the city landscape as if by an angry giant's hand. Like a silent accomplice, flames leaped through the wreckage. Great hospitals and other structures collapsed. Everywhere, the quake trapped its casual human victims. When it had passed, the city counted the cost. 64 dead, $500 million in property damage. Because the water behind a weakened dam was quickly lowered, thousands of lives were saved, which otherwise might have been lost. In its aftermath, alarmed public agencies radically expanded their earthquake preparations. Today, not only standard surveying methods, but a wide array of new instruments are employed to monitor California's fractured landscape. Using laser beams and radio waves from remote stars, scientists can measure the state for crustal changes or plate movements as small as an inch. Along the San Andreas, a network of seismic devices reports local changes in the release of radioactive gas from rock strata, sudden drops in the water level of wells, variations in gravity, or the Earth's magnetic field. Other meters detect the slightest movement deep beneath the surface, measure strain in a locked section of the fault. Like the Morris family, the state of California also is checking its basement, above which 24 million people live. From hundreds of instruments scattered across the length of the state, continuous reports flow into separate computer centers for the southern and the northern sectors. At the United States Geological Survey in Menlo Park, widely diverse information is correlated and condensed to provide a summary of seismic activity during each passing month. Like scholars trying to break an enemy code or decipher a lost language, scientists are trying to discern a consistent meaning in all the signals sent from the Earth. Though the San Andreas remains an enigma, a silent threat of havoc to come, sophisticated technology is bringing closer the time when man may be able to predict earthquakes with reasonable accuracy and certainty. Scientists know that in prediction lies a major defense against catastrophe. Using an instrument no more complicated than a garden hoe, one young geologist from the California Institute of Technology has shown that the key to the future may lie in the past. At excavations along the fault at Pallet Creek near the Mojave, 
Dr. Kerry C. has revealed a repeat pattern of California quakes hundreds of years before okay, so any recorded history of the region. We are on the main trace of the San Andreas Fault, and the layer I just scraped off has been radiocarbon dated at 1350 AD. The layer right above it, which has the beautiful orange color here and here, has a radiocarbon date near its top of about 1560 AD, or about the time Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel. This layer dates from about the birth of Benjamin Franklin, 1700. And this layer, about right here, was the surface of the Earth at the time of the 1857 earthquake. Now, this is the main trace of the San Andreas Fault, running up through these layers, up through about to here. Here's the 1350 A.D. layer, broken by the fault trace, coming up through the 1560 A.D. layer, here. So, here we have the Pacific Plate, and here we have the North American Plate, broke only by this very narrow trace or plane of the San Andreas Fault. And it continues on up, up through the 1700s level, and stopping at this level, the 1857 level. In 1857, there occurred the great Fort Tejon earthquake, which was the last great earthquake to break the San Andreas Fault in the southern part of the state. Elsewhere at this site, we have exposures that show a total of 11 prehistoric earthquakes and the great Fort Tejon earthquake of 1857. The radiocarbon dates show that the earthquakes occur with uh, a frequency. They occur about every 145 years. It's been 125 years since the great Fort Tejon earthquake. The chances are really quite good that within our lifetime, we're going to see another Great Fort Tejon earthquake. Give me the number of dead you anticipate, and I will uh, that you're estimating, and I'll try to work it out on this end. Estimates of injured range from 50 to 80,000, with an unknown number trapped in collapsed structures. At this time, the numbers of dead may be in excess of 10,000. To train disaster agencies and to alert the public, the state's Office of Emergency Services stages yearly drills. I would like to clarify what's turned out to be a rumor of a radioactive release problem at Caltech. Alex Cunningham, director of the California Office of Emergency Services. The scenario for this exercise is that an earthquake occurred yesterday in Los Angeles actually about 30 miles northwest of San Bernardino along the San Andreas Fault. Its magnitude for exercise purposes, 8.3. And believe me, the, we are very selective at the state level on using guard resources, and, and I, I recommend strongly now, I can't handle a delicate issue like this on the phone, I recommend very strongly that if you want the guard for this, that you're gonna have to come through bureaucratically. We need to have an update as of this time on the number of uh, injuries and deaths, please. All the hospital beds in uh, Northern County are, appear to be down. Southern yeah. County looks like they're in pretty good shape, but they've got a needs assessment team will be back in a half an hour and give us all the figures. Hold on a sec. We gotta I'm not get, doing anything with it. I'm okay, we got to get this together. The state of California is very well prepared to handle a moderate earthquake. And the citizens who have been through these kind of quakes are reasonably well prepared. But when we talk about a catastrophic earthquake, something in the area of an 8 or an 8.3, no level of government, and particularly the individual citizens, are prepared for such an event. It's no longer a question of if the big earthquake is coming. It's simply a matter of when. Scientists are telling us, because of recent seismic activity and other phenomena, other scientific data, that the great earthquake will strike in Southern California sometime in the next 30 years. Unfortunately, many people say, well, if it's 30 years away, we don't have to worry about it. It's not 30 years away. It could happen tomorrow. It could happen today. It could happen next month. But sometime in the next 30 years, we're going to have it, and people damn well better prepare themselves for it. Distantly aware of threatened holocausts, most Los Angeles residents remain caught in the traumas and traffic jams of daily life. Too few know the mathematics of terror. At the time of the 1857 quake, 11,000 people lived in Los Angeles. Today, there are more than 7 million. Many remember the impact of the San Fernando tremor, 
but the 8.3 earthquake, which scientists now predict, will be a shock 800 times as strong. A natural disaster without precedent in American history. Thirty-five hundred years ago, on the Aegean island of Santorini, these ruins, too, held a civilization. Here, long before the Parthenon, the maritime community of Akrotiri created a culture that rivaled the splendors of nearby Minoan Crete. In frescoes, artists painted the sunlit landscapes of man in his springtime, the years in Eden, when the earth was filled with wonders. Upon the walls were mirrored the ordinary tasks and pleasures of a small world in which the simplest acts of everyday life held meaning. And even the gods often behaved like noisy neighbors. Over the wide sea, returning seamen brought strange gifts and creatures from the shadowy lands beyond, told of odysseys across a world still new. Now they are gone abruptly vanished in a great catastrophe. All that remain are a half-excavated civilization under glass, a few amphoras in orderly array, life and death filed on an index card. One of the scientists trying to decipher the puzzle of the past, Dr. Christos Dumas of the University of Athens, leads Dr. Ballard through the remains of a city that died 35 centuries ago. This is an ancient street leading to the Triangle Square, flanked on the left by the uh, building Delta and on the right by the West House. Now, here is where you found the frescoes. Yes, uh, we found frescoes and other things which show that we are discovering here a very highly civilized society of the Bronze Age. Uh, the houses are individual, surrounded by streets. They are several stories, as you see, and we have indoor plumbing connected directly with the drainage system of the street. So you had a, a society of individual families yes. living together. And every house was an entity by itself. And here we can see how sophisticated these houses were. The basement, as in many other houses, was used uh, for storing goods. A variety of uh, crops like uh, barley, flour of barley, uh, lentils, uh, various uh, nuts like almonds. So they had a, a pretty good diet. I mean, it was yes, varied. Yes, and uh, they were consuming also seafood because we found uh, shells of sea urchins and remains of dried fish. The city was captured by the earthquakes, and this staircase shows that it was broken before the eruption of the volcano. So this probably caused them to evacuate. Yes, it was a warning for the people. And then after the earthquake, the major eruption occurred. Uh, yes, it, it destroyed almost everything, as you see. And uh, then the site was covered with uh, volcanic ash. Before the great warning tremors, Akrotiri lay on the flank of a steeply sloping island, unaware that miles below, the Earth's crust was in movement. Soon after the quake, the island exploded in one of history's prodigious volcanic eruptions. Suddenly, a mountain had disappeared. Its walls collapsed into a volcanic caldera, now filled by the inrushing sea. A vast, searing cloud of pumice and ash buried Akrotiri and surged over the Mediterranean with an impact on history that still is being assessed. We're inside the caldera. Behind me are the layered walls of the volcano, which record its long history the black layers are basaltic lava flows. The red ones are tephra, ejected from the volcanic vent. These prehistoric layers once formed a great volcano over 5,000 feet high. About 3,500 years ago, 
the entire volcano erupted, destroying over two-thirds of the island. At the top, today, you can see a white layer of pumice and ash, which records that great event. That layer is over 100 feet thick. Human beings still cling to the narrow rim of cliffs that now surrounds emptiness. Today, several thousand islanders live on the heights and fish or search for sponges in the depths of the caldera. Steep paths link them with the ports through which supplies, much of their fresh water, and occasional visitors arrive by sea. Today, the centers of Western civilization have moved far beyond Santorini. Insulated from the rumors and alarms of a wider world, it has settled into the ways of village life. Upon the cliffs, workmen build and repair structures using the very ash and pumice of the explosion that once destroyed their island. In the fields around them, farmers tend vineyards and reap grain planted in the volcanic soil. The pumice is even sold for profit, was once exported for the building of the Suez Canal more than a century ago. Intermittently, strong tremors still shake the island. But the widows of Santorini remain solitary symbols of the tenacity by which life endures. Beneath them, one plate slides under another in endless movement. Even the gods may change, but prayer remains a step in the search for reassurance and certainty. On Good Friday, worshippers are surrounded by frescoes that describe not the joys of life, but its tragic burdens. Yet for the devout islanders, faith holds a triumphant hope. Out of death's darkness, life returns, a flame passed from candle to candle. In the ritual of 20 centuries, the villagers again find an ancient recognition. In the Easter story of resurrection, they tell their own. <laughs> After the resurrection, joy. The breaking of eggs to release the symbolic life within. Across the island, after 40 days of fasting, the villagers feast and dance. The world has changed many times since this woman lived in Santorini. Her gods have vanished. The streets on which she walked now end in walls of ash. Yet in these dancing rhythms of life, she might hear echoes of another time, the refrains of home. Imperceptible to living generations, the change goes on toward a future that science's computers already have begun to outline. By its present drift, Africa in its clockwise movement will close the Mediterranean and collide with southern Europe, raising great new mountain ranges like a rumpled rug.
In Africa itself, the sea at last will flood the desert thorn trees, isolate Eastern Africa, invade a domain once held by elephants and lions. In the Americas, as elsewhere, life will be radically altered. Mecca for millions of fugitives from the wintry east, Los Angeles may have to doctor its swimming pools with antifreeze. Set at the edge of the Pacific Plate, it is moving relentlessly toward Alaska at the rate of two or three inches a year. Ten million years from now, San Francisco will find that for a time, its scorned southern rival has become a suburb. New York may become part of a vast volcanic range as the expanding Atlantic floor passes under the eastern coast. Compared to Earth's history, man's tenure has been dazzling and brief. In 10,000 years, he has created language, built cathedrals, invented the means to destroy life on Earth. His computers can project the destination of continents 200 million years from now. But where man will be, none can predict. <laughs> 